Thank you very much for that welcome. Thank you, and thank you, John, for that very kind introduction. Uh, um, and I am actually delighted and honoured to be here today at your annual conference as Chair of the Committee on Standards in Public Life to talk about the importance of ethical standards in policing and indeed our most recent report, Tone from the Top, Leadership, Ethics and Accountability in Policing. This uh, document, uh, command paper, which we delivered to the government in June, I have in my hand, and uh, some of you in the room contributed to this uh, this document, and I would like to express again my thanks, uh, and I'll be saying this again later, but also some of you in the room may have uh, points that you want to make about the document and, uh, and developments of argument that maybe should be made, and we at the Committee on Standards for Public Life would be very glad to hear from you indeed. Now, the Committee on Standards and Public Life is an independent committee that provides advice to the Prime Minister, and its role is to promote high standards across the public sphere. And indeed, in, uh, just before my appointment, its remit was expanded under the Triennial Review to cover all those delivering public services, that's to say, not the old public sector, which police are part, but the, the, uh, those private firms who now play such a role in delivering certain types of public service, uh, a multi-billion pound industry. So they too have come within our remit. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, we've already produced a, uh, uh, an important document in, in my time on the, that new public-private mix and how it's working. Now, the committee's first report recommended the seven principles of public life, which are popularly known as the Nolan Principles, to guide the behaviour of those who serve the public in any way. And they are selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership. And the first report of the committee, 20 odd years ago now, set out the three common threads to ensure that the seven principles of public life were properly understood and will, will come integral to the conduct of individuals and the culture of organisations. And these threads are one, codes of conduct, two, independent scrutiny, and three, guidance and education. In Lord Nolan's words, it requires those in senior positions to set a good example, and it requires organisations to monitor the awareness of those standards and take remedial action where necessary. And since its inception, the committee has reported on issues such as political party finance, local government standards, public appointments and MPs' expenses. And indeed, our report following the MPs' expenses scandal was accepted within a few hours and is part of the package of measures and the working with IPSA, which actually explains something insufficiently commented upon in recent years since the great scandal following the Daily Telegraph story in 2008, uh, that actually the MPs' expenses scandal issue, as it once existed, in effect no longer exists in that shape or size, individual cases of course, but the, uh, the, the actual expenses scandal as it was defined at that time really no longer exists. And that's part of the work of my committee, my predecessors, uh, um, which I think it has been a valuable contribution to our public life. And, uh, there is not one area, however, and I think everybody in the room knows this, of our public life not affected by scandal. And I, I should really be more than aware of this as a member of the House of Lords at the present time. Um, and some would argue that, um, you know, if you think about the last 20 years, the Nolan principles haven't worked. And it is actually a difficult job to be chair of Committee on Standards of Public Life. One reason is that transparency, which you in the police, other sectors of public service, have all adhered to much more in recent years over the last two decades. It has not actually taken the tricks in terms of public confidence that those who advocated transparency thought it would. It doesn't mean that you can go back on the, on, on the need for transparency. There are a number of reasons why it is absolutely essential, but it has not taken the tricks in terms of reassuring the public. Uh, um, a good example would be the one that I have just given, which is uh, MPs' expenses, where in fact everything now can be checked by a member of the public, in effect, after Ipsos reforms. But actually the public aren't as reassured by that as perhaps they, in principle, were expected to be. 
So this is this is really why we have some real difficulties um, in, in this area, and I'm not, um, you know, speaking to you as somebody who thinks um, the Nolan principles are motherhood and apple pie, and all you have to do is to keep preaching the Nolan principles and everything will be all right. Uh, if I ever did think that, uh, the two years that I've had in the job have encouraged me in, or discouraged me in that belief in a fairly radical way. Um, and indeed, to, to take a most dramatic example, I've mentioned the problems in the House of Lords. Uh, one of the hardest things for me to bear about that is that actually, following our report on lobbying, uh, about 18 months ago or so, we persuaded the House of Lords um, not just to do appropriate things like reduce the gift levels that, that, the, that members might receive quite radically, to slash them really, um, but also we persuaded the House of Lords to adopt a new, tighter, toughened version of the Nolan Principles that uh, the committee had been working on for some years. And then when the current crisis broke, what one actually saw was the press holding up these new, uh, tighter, tough principles of probity in public life to judge how far the House of Lords uh, or particular members of it had fallen from those appropriate standards. So something that I was inclined to think of uh, uh, 18 months ago, a year ago, as a success, and I still think is the right thing for us to have done and for the House of Lords to have done, but in the current moment, people now even use it as a further example. Look, they said that they would follow these high standards. Look how far uh, they actually are from these high standards. So it's a difficult situation. Uh, um, but the bottom line is this. The public are clear on what the ethical standards that they expect should be observed, and they're consistent in their expectation that those in public life should abide by them. And this is true for you as much as it is for members of, uh, of, of, of our Parliament. And the definition of principles set out in the seven principles are still relevant. They are a common barometer and should apply to all those delivering public services. This is particularly the case in the context of changing models of delivery of public services, increased devolution, which is projected, and complex structures now where lines of accountability can actually be blurred, which brings me to local policing accountability, which many of you have a sharp interest in. Our inquiry, what is its background? Well, local policing accountability, as I think everybody in the room is aware, changed substantially as a result of the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act of 2011. PCCs were intended to be the voice of the public, replacing bureaucratic accountability with local uh, uh, democratic accountability. The whole concept behind the, the Peace and Crime Commissioners was this concept of a more direct local accountability. PCCs control over £12 billion pounds of funding, which is a lot of money, and the local police and crime panels were intended to scrutinise and support PCCs. Now, as the new arrangements have been in place for over two years, the Committee of Standards and Public Life thought it was timely to review, test the model's operation, and learn any lessons. And to put this very starkly, uh, if I say something which I think everybody in the room will recognise, on the one hand, you had uh, in the media stories of police and crime commissioners whose conduct and behaviour seemed, well, invited media comment which was not particularly favourable, and a number of classic cases of that. On the other, at the other end of the scale, there were police and crime commissioners who had a very high reputation, um, particularly in areas like uh, increasing uh, underst uh, 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 the, the understanding and response of local police forces to crimes against women, for example. Uh, uh, so there was, a, there was a areas where they were believed to have worked extremely well, and areas where they were believed to have worked, putting this politely, not quite so well. And the headlines were either at one end, there's newspaper stories, if you collect them up you'll see they're either at one end of the scale or the other. And we thought there must be something a little bit more complicated and complex to say about this. Um, so we started to do quite a lot of research into it. And it was not just about PCCs, it was about leadership, ethics and accountability. I want to say something else just as a warning uh, to people in the room. It was not about the delivery of policing. Every single uh, policing service, it's not about delivery. 
We don't do delivery. We do the Nolan Principles at the Committee on Science and Public Life. Every single person in the room knows more than I do, or my committee knows about delivery of policing uh, services. It was not about delivery. It was about these questions of accountability, ethics, leadership, and how, this, how, the, how, how the new model was operating in the context of those concerns. And the inquiry was launched in October of last year. It had four aims to identify the structures in place um, it, 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 for ensuring high standards of behaviour and to examine the effectiveness of those structures and to identify what was working well, what could be improved, and to consider the role of leaders in promoting and sustaining high standards. And the methodology, I think, again, I should explain that the resources of the Committee on Standards, uh, it, like everybody in the room, our resources are not what you will remember in the public services. I'll just leave it like that. Again, everybody in the room will know what I mean. Our resources have been seriously cut, and we have to, if we're doing a research project, think of ways of a slim uh, model of doing it, an efficient way of model, model of doing it. I think we did this as serious as we could, but if you say, and you look at this, you didn't actually visit the majority of the PCCs in the country, it's true. But we have serious polling, serious discussion with uh, the key stakeholders, academics, and visits to a very considerable number of areas and meetings both with PCCs, chief constables, the senior officers, and PC PCPs. Uh, despite some high profile lapses, I should say, and I'm glad to say, in a room full of police superintendents. Our most recent poll here again showed that trust in the police is pretty high 59% of respondents trust police, or the public trust police officers to tell them the truth. Um, 55 agree that the police are held to account for their actions, and 54% agree that the police were dealing with crime and antisocial behaviours in, 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 in ways that mattered. So most respondents actually have a positive impression of the conduct and accountability of the police. And I'm very happy to say that to you. That's our most recent polling. If I was to add a slight caution to that, I would say that probably our polling, going back, say, even to 2012, was even better for the police. 2012, I remember, it was near 70%. It's the high 60s. Um, for acceptability, for example, people were twice as likely to believe a senior police officer as a member of the cabinet uh, in the polling, which is, you know, uh, but one of the things is that you're all aware of the issues which have, uh, and the things that have reached the headlines, and even in 2012, I think, uh, one third of the forces in the country had senior officers who were uh, um, facing some difficulties. Uh, uh, there has been, I think it's a slight drop. I just would say, you're still, well, you're certainly doing a lot better than the House of Lords, if I can say that. You're still in a comfortable position in terms of public perception. I don't actually think it's getting uh, stronger. That would mean my sense of the polling is a slight because of, and I think you all would be aware of the sort of headlines which explain what, why that is. But you're still in a, a, well, let's put it this way, lots of other people in the public service would kill for those numbers that you have. Um, but I, I honestly believe, I suppose I should say this, you'll have to fight to retain them because the public is just, the mood of the public tends towards cynicism and scepticism about all public servants. And it does not take much for the mood to become sour. And also there's a tendency now, um, which was not there when Lord Nolan started, um, which was to, when a scandal breaks out, to think, oh, it's a few bad apples. That was there 20 years ago. Now people tend to think it's all engrossing, it's everyone. Don't BBC, Parliament, and it's very, very hurtful. And I, I'm sure everybody in the room has at times been hurt by things that have been said about the police. When you know that the great majority of your colleagues, as I know the great majority of my colleagues, so that's in the House of Lords, are doing an honourable job, it's very, very hurtful when you see that shift in public opinion. It has not happened uh, in the case of policing, um, but everybody is on thin ice. Now, the key test of how well the new model of police accountability is working adequately is whether the public knows about it and understands it and engages with, with us. Our survey is not so happy in that respect. Only one in four survey correspondents thought that local people had much say in policing matters. Only 10% knew the name of their local PCC. 
44% uh, knew that PCCs were elected by the public, which is quite high, but only 15% were aware of police and crime panels. And perhaps this is interesting, because I don't know how you can explain it. 60% actually said they weren't really interested in finding out more about policing in their local area. And why that's so is a matter for debate, and I don't have a, a, have a solid answer, but I do draw your attention. These figures are in our report. Um, now, ethical standards. I turn now to our findings on ethical standards. We find much evidence of increased professionalism and interest in ethically based policing. And individual chief officers championing ethical leadership and high standards of behaviour. And I must say, in the trips that I made around the country, I was very impressed by that. PCCs were more visible, I think it is true, to, and this is the, the positive aspect of the change, they're more visible to local communities than the former police authorities were. And we saw many positive examples of engagement, yet as our survey showed, awareness and interest remained low, and has remained low in terms of electoral turnout for PCCs. We saw many different mechanisms being used to embed and support high standards of behaviour with varying effectiveness. Experience is evolving, but as there will inevitably be a turnover of PCCs in the new elections in 2016, we felt that the, the best thing to do was to capture best practice, uh, draw attention to it in this document, and to see if it could spread, be made to spread throughout the country. We also found widespread recognition of the importance of the College of Policing's Code of Ethics and the core policing values. We saw diverse good practice within police forces in implementing and embedding the code, including ethical awareness training, ethics committees, and regular reinforcement of ethical behaviour. If you have further examples of good practice and the things that work, we would be very grateful if you got in touch with us. Ethical risks. Our findings also highlighted significant ethical risks. Some of them, I think, will be familiar to people in the room in the new dispensation. But I'll summarise them. Um, by definition, if you invest a lot of power in one individual, the PCC, it carries risks. We think stronger checks and balances are needed to, save, to safeguard what several people called us the monocratic role of the PCC. There is still much confusion about the roles and responsibility of the PCCs and the Chief Constable. Who is the police chief? Who's the crime czar? Who's the top cop? And that confusion feeds through the, into the complaint system and, pro, and the process for complaints against police and PCCs alike. There is no clear process to take action at the moment against the PCC whose conduct falls below the standards expected of a holder of public office. And if our view that represents a significant gap in a model of accountability, and if I could just stop for a minute to remind you, we now do have recall mechanisms for members of parliament. It's a very controversial measure, and it'll be interesting to see how it works in practice. But nonetheless, it is clearly an anomaly that you can have recall for an elected person, a member of parliament, but not for another elected person, a, a police and crime commissioner. And the Home Secretary has said some things about it. She may say more about it tomorrow. And obviously, this is something that's been thought about. Um, but in, in our view, it is, it is a clear, clearly an anomaly uh, and, and it, a significant gap in the model of accountability. We are also concerned about the appointment process for chief police officers, and I'm absolutely certain that there are people in the room who, who, who have had this thought. And the, our concerns are that it is, is it robust enough, is there confidence in it, and will it provide a continuing supply of strong leaders? The same applies to senior staff in PCC offices, and joint appointments by PCCs and chief constables have inherent risks. We consider there were insufficient safeguards for the PCC's monitoring and officer role. More detail on this is contained in this document. And finally, we concluded there were currently sufficient, insufficient constructive challenge uh, and active support by police and crime panels in PCC decision making. And that, that's a really difficult area because when you have a strong, very effective PCC experienced, it, I don't underestimate the difficulties of a PCP in actually trying to have a balanced debate with them. But nonetheless, there, wasn't a, uh, there, was, there was an insufficient balance in our view. Now, with all that in mind, we have made 20 evidence-based and proportionate recommendations designed to assist all the various pleasures to 
players to develop and strengthen the, the ways ethical standards and policing are upheld and sustained. And we built them from the bottom up and from good practice that we've seen, and we hope that the rest can learn from the best. I've only time now to focus on our key recommendations, organisation by organisation, and I will try to do that in my complete concluding remarks. Our key recommendations are for the Home Office to review whether sufficient powers are available to take action against the PCC whose conduct falls below the standard expected, and as I say, maybe clearly the Home Office is moving towards some conclusion on this, and indeed you may hear very soon. Um, but we are very keenly interested in this point. For PCCs, a recommendation from a, a, for, that we make is for a mandatory national minimum code of conduct, also holding the Chief Constable to account, should explicitly include the promotion of ethical behaviour and embedding the code of ethics. Appointment procedures for Chief Constables and top PCC support staff should comply with open and transparent processes that include the involvement of a named individual with appropriate expertise. And this is, of course, quite normal in other types of public appointment. For the Police and Crime Panel, we recommend a more strategic approach, including a forward plan of work drawn from the Police and Crime Plan and specifying information required from PCCs we should make it accessible to assist scrutiny and gain the support and leverage of elected councillors. For the associations, and here I mean think the associations like the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners and the Policing and Crime Chief Executives, for the associations we recommend, Association of Local Government Officers as well, we recommend collaboration on a model memorandum of understanding between the PCCs chief constables and chief executives so that respective roles and safeguards are hardwired and in place ahead of difficulties and controversies and the provision of national guidance on the meaning of a decision uh, 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 on, on, uh, is given on the meaning of a decision of significant public interest. This is a key term. Those of you who know the theology of the way PCCs work is uh, the key term of what a significant public interest is. We need to have that defined. Uh, if we're going to have a clear-cut working for the PCPs, because it determines how they work, but nobody quite agrees what is an issue of significant public interest, and we need clarity as to the definition of that if we're going to have them to work more, more effectively. The committee has also proposed an ethical checklist for PCCs. Current and future PCCs need to make a visible commitment to adopt the best practice at the heart of our recommendations. That way, PCCs can reassure the public at the 2016 elections about their approach to ethical standards. And we really think that's going to be a critical moment. And that we hope that candidates will reassure the public about what they're prepared to do uh, uh, in terms of their ethical conduct. In doing so, PCCs will need to continue their focus at a local community level, but balance this with their regional and national roles too, embed government structures that promote ethical behaviour, provide ethical accountability, and sustain public confidence and trust. Now, 20 years of Nolan Principles has taught us, go back to my earlier remarks, that you can't just publish a code and think you've done ethics. I have a nightmare. Um, which is not decreasing in recent weeks, and it's, it, it, it's actually a real nightmare that one of my officials comes in, knocks the door and says, um, good news, Paul, ISIS have just adopted the Committee of Standards of Public Life and the Nolan Principles. Um, what the nightmare is about is people just signing up for the principles and then carrying on in a wicked way. And it is a real nightmare that keeps me awake at night. Uh, and it, it's, um, it, it's, uh, I've become increasingly aware of, the, of, of this problem in recent times. You can't just publish a code and think you have done ethics. We need sound mechanisms such as ethic committees that can support ethical decision making and these should be complementary to and not a substitute for embedding a culture of high ethical standards. Our call in this report is for greater energy and consistency to be applied to promoting higher ethical standards. This will be all the more critical as the nature of crime, along with how policing was delivered, is, as you're all well aware, set to change. With new and increasingly complex crime, reductions in police budgets, greater regional collaboration, and further de de devolutionary changes such as metro mayors, the road of leaders, including 
those of you who are in this room, will be increasingly crucial in upholding high ethical standards in policing. The tone and culture of policing is set by those at the top, and the public are entitled to know that those that they elect will promote, support and sustain high ethical standards in spirit and in letter, and above all, by example. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.